Friends, enemies and the indifferent, welcome to the second episode of the Night of the Black Sun podcast with myself, Rob the Baron Miller. In this episode I'm going to be speaking to a friend in Australia about life and experiences as a punk rocker, as a father, as a farmer, a soldier and as a seeker. So let's pull on the old goggles, pull out the chocks, fire up the fucker and head down to the Antipodes. So with little further ado, let me introduce my first guest. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by my friend Matt Wishranger from right down under uh, in Australia. Um, and we're going to kind of pull apart his life and uh, find out some of his experiences. Matt, Mr. Bush Ranger, uh, you are very welcome to the first Man to Man uh, podcast for Night of the Black Sun. Hey, great. Thanks, Rob. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Great. It's good to have you on board. Um, we're kind of making our way along as we as uh, as we can at the moment. So it's very new to me, all this sort of stuff and the tech and, and that nonsense. But we'll get there. So we'll just basically... Um, have a bit of an informal chat and find out a bit more about you for for our listener. I think we maybe will have maybe one or two by the end of the week. We'll see how it goes. But uh, I've I've got um, I've got one first podcast which is kind of like just introducing things, and that's some um, that's set in the background at the moment, ready to to press go. So we'll see how we do with this. Um, yeah, as I say, thanks for for joining me. I wanted to really um, pick your brains about what, what what was it like growing up in Australia and, and are you what what generation are you are you sort of 70s 80s 90s I, I'm not sure what age you are uh right so I was born in 79 so I just got the tail end of the uh you know the 70s grew up in the 80s and you know from there so I'm 40 whatever that is now 43 or this year so 44 so I'm um, so yeah and that was a reoccurring theme theme that seemed to keep popping up in my life I always seem to get the tail end mm. of a sort of phase in the world when it was just sort of ending and transitioning to someone in, into a different sort of phase you know and yeah so I was born in 79 right at the end okay so when we were jumping up and down spitting at each other uh, you were just popping out of the womb um yeah so did, yeah. did you kind of did you kind of like because i you know myself and my brother really we kind of we consider ourselves like first generation punks having having grown up in, you know in the in the, the actual age when the pistols were going all that kind of stuff and things things changed almost overnight for us i guess over here it was like there was that that um distinction between punk which rapidly declined and, and went into new wave and then you've got this whole thing the anarcho-punk thing which was altogether different and which we tended to fall into ourselves so how did you pick up on the were you involved like in the scene as we put it no I was just um like born oh my life's been very different lots of moving around lots of shifting from all different sorts of aspects of Australian life to another but I grew up in the suburbs and this was like you know young family young mum and dad uh in a new suburb on the edge of the city you know all new houses and it had that sort of air of excitement that you get in those new suburbs you know with young hmm. families just got a first mortgage growing up that sort of thing okay um and it was just a standard suburban life growing up but then when I was quite young um <clears throat> my father had an accident at work and you know before that it was your classic dad went to work mum was a stay-at-home mum and um once dad had that accident you know it was the early 80s uh there was no such thing as working compensation well there was but you had to fight for years mm. and years to, to be acknowledged you know so mum had to go to work dad stayed at home and he was a very wild old-fashioned guy he grew up in a Pacific in one of the Pacific Islands. I won't sort of mention what it is, wow. but um, yeah. he, he grew up in the Pacific Islands with an extremely, uh, like his dad, like, wow, if my father made a mistake at home, he got absolutely belted. Like, this like, was like that. Yeah, like just hard um, disciplinarian kind of thing, yeah? Oh, yeah, to the point, of, like, it was just my dad just got bashed by his dad, you know what I mean? So my, my dad, when he had that accident and he had to stop work, and my mum went to work. He was like a wild animal in, in a cage, you know what I mean? Being stuck yes. at home making school lunches. <laughs> yeah. So, and he compared to his life growing up, he was good to us. Like, yeah, if we made a mistake, we got the belt. 
But, yeah. you know, it wasn't just random beatings like what he got growing up. So compared to his father, he was an angel. Um, mm-hmm. And in that, in that situation, you know, dad in a lot of pain, they tried to fix his accident that he had at work, you know, had operations, stuff like that, just made it worse. And so he was on painkillers. Him and mum, in, inevitable, him and mum started fighting. They looked for an answer to all this and they mm-hmm. became, overnight, became Christians, like oh. full-on Christians. Okay. Um, so we did the whole Christian thing. Yep. And and even at that young age, um, like TV was pretty strict for us when I was growing up, so I read a lot. Um, but sitting there in Sunday school, like we had to go to all the sermons, night school, uh, night, the, the night sermons, you know, with a really good Christians go on Sunday night as well, as well as Sunday in the morning. Double dosing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And just, and then we went to a Christian school as well. Um, and just all the way back then, you know, pretty much heard the Bible from one end to the other repeatedly. Uh, there were so many things that just didn't make sense. Like to even as like, you know, I don't know what it was, six, seven, eight, nine sort of thing. Mm-hmm. It just didn't make sense. You know, one minute God's this omniscient, all powerful thing that just clicks his fingers and makes the world. But then he's waging a war against rebellious angels. And, you know, yeah. And, and you know, there's it, none of it makes sense. So, yeah. So I grew up in the suburbs. Um, Mum and dad, dad an accident, parents broke up. And then after the Christian thing failed, mum and dad broke up. And then overnight, they were no longer Christians. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and my mum moved My mum moved to a rural area, which is deep. And that, that was where I really came out of my Sherlock. That's, I loved it. Once and what sort of age were you when you, moved? what kind of age were you uh, when you came out of your shell? And... Oh, about 11, I think we moved to the bush. And oh, okay. it was awesome. It was absolutely awesome. And um, but it was around that time when we first moved to the bush and all of a sudden I could just go roam and free and do all this sort of crazy stuff um, that I discovered punk rock. I heard, you know, mm. Sex Pistols somewhere, saw it on Saturday morning TV. And by this stage, you know, Sex Pistols were all done and dusted. Mm-hmm. It was all over with, you know, heavy metal. My brother used to listen to heavy metal. So it was always Slayer and that playing in the, in the background mm. once the Christian phase was over. Yeah. Um, and we abandoned our Christian values overnight. Did, so did you, was it like a kind of like great release then being with your mum and, and getting into the outback and just like being a young man, being able to kind of like start afresh again? Yeah. Well, even as a kid growing up in the suburbs, all I used to think about was we used to go camping out in the bush and, mm. and I, I would live for that, you know, the drudgery of the, of the Christian school just living for when we're going to go out in the bush, you know, and I, I was obsessed with anything sort of like native, you know, non-suburban, you know, I, I used to read about a lot about the Australian Aboriginals and, you know, mm-hmm. Native American Indians and how they used to survive, you know, and one with the land, more holistic sort of thing. Even as a young age, that really appealed to me. And then when we moved to the bush, all of a sudden we weren't just going to the supermarket to buy our food, you know, we would see our beef being grown, you know, we started growing veggies and you became more in tune with like, so if it's raining, it doesn't just mean, you know, it's going to be raining while you go to school. It means like all the fruit trees are getting a water, you know I mean? If it's frosting, it means your oranges are going to be sweet. You know, you're more aware of the environment. So we moved to the country and surrounded by traditional, you know, country people. And, you know, back in the early 90s, there was still a lot of old-fashioned Australian country people getting around, rough as guts, but friendly as hell, do anything for you. Mm. And at any mo- and I had this little, almost like a little secret where I was like listening to punk rock, you know, where <laughs> it was completely odds at odds to what I was, the life I was living, you know, because by this stage, you know, I'd, I'd moved on from the Sex Pistols and, you know, I heard the Sex Pistols and the first ever cassette I bought was the Exploited live on stage. Um, wow, yeah. I've still got it here somewhere in a box. And, you know, and by this stage, you know, then the Dead Kennedys came along and then, you know, the anarcho-punk stuff, like what you were saying, started to creep in, you know, and then everyone's saying, you know, unless you're a vegetarian, you're an mm. evil person, you know. Yeah. You know, all, and, you know, all country people, all people from the country are racists, you know, yep. they're Nazis and all this sort of stuff. And it's like, well, I'm not seeing that. So, you know what, I'm just going to, Punk rock is something to me. I, I figured out so fairly on in the piece because it was so with odds with what I was seeing that punk rock was a form of uh, letting off steam yeah. and voicing your anger. It's not you don't base your life on 
you know, fuck yeah, the there's... system, snatch it up, live in a pile of rubbish, you know, drug yeah. overdose. You know, but so many people alcohol. get so many people get stuck stuck in that kind of paradigm, don't they? And they think that that's part of it. And you know, it's often it's often kids from a sort of like a nice background that kind of like tentatively sort of go into these environments and go, well, yeah, that's cool. I'll, I'll, I'll hang out in there knowing quite full well that, yeah, if things turn, turn uh, pear shaped, they can get out of there and then go, go running back to their mommy and daddy. You know, you see so much. Yeah. I was in a, um, in a, uh, a plane in, um, in Scandinavia and we, we stayed at a squat in, uh, where was it in Norway? Um, and for me, it was just such a depressing, this is, this is about um, seven, five, six, seven years ago. So it was a depressing experience going back and seeing a squat, which like, it was like one of the worst shitholes that we'd been in growing up as kids. It's like, really, is, is nobody actually learning yeah. nothing here? Is this some form of yeah. some kind of like weird um, narcissistic self-indulgence? And kind of like you say, the, there's this attitude that there must be some kind of like big book of punk rock and you get so many kids that latched onto that and said you know these these are the rules it, we're, within this subculture and these are the things you're you're supposed to be thinking and doing and all the rest of that and you know for amoebics it was pretty obvious quite early on it's like ah we're not doing that and uh, we kind of broke the broke the mold yeah. musically and also i guess philosophically too but it didn't stop us having to be involved in the heart of that and having to see that sort of um general decline really yeah and it's funny you mentioned amoebics and because um you know being a teenager i left school as soon as i could year 10 and went out working um you know so i was like 15 or something and i was going out on the cattle stations like uh putting up cattle fences so that's that's hard work you know oh, from yeah. sun up to sun down i was only like 15 years old you know you're cutting trees down you're digging holes you're pulling out barbed wire and you know you're rolling it out it's hard work and i used to go out there for like six seven days at a time like live in a cache in, in a hay shed or whatever we're cooking our own food just in the workers quarters and then i'd get paid and i'd go back and then i'll just you know do the punk rock thing in town because it, it, this was the 90s you could go drink in the pub in in rural australia at 15 if you were working no sure. problem at all great yeah. so i'd come home I'd come home with a pocket full of cash while my mates were like still doing a year 11 and 12 at school and just <laughs> ride, and, you know, and just get shit faced, do the whole punk rock thing, write <laughs> yourself off. Um, and, you know, we were uh, trail bikes, you know, unregistered, a lot of them just tearing around, you know, just being crazy. Um, and it was always, and, you know, experimenting with certain things. And even when you were like, you know, you'd feel like crap after having a big party or a big bend or whatever. And I, uh, and deep inside, I kind of knew that this isn't a way to base your life. Like, mm. this is just a thing you do. Yeah. Um, get it all out of your system. And then I discovered Amibix Arise. Um, yeah. I got that from somewhere uh, because back then there was no internet or anything. I had the, I had this, someone gave me a, um, a catalogue, this printed paper catalogue with mm. just type, you know, hey, Amibix Arise, you know, yeah. early crust influence you know, 10 bucks and, and you'll fill out the form. And, and then about six weeks later, you get this thing in the mail with all the vinyl and all this sort of stuff. And once I heard, once I heard power remains arise and chain reaction is like, holy shit, these guys are different. You know, mm -hmm. they're not sitting in some slum behind McDonald's smashing bottles. These guys are out in nature, you know, mm. seeing things, you know, and what is what we were seeing, like we'd have big parties out in the bush on, in a full moon with a bonfire, you know, and, and just get off your face and you, oh, it was just wild, mate, you know. I think with, I, with, I just felt... Sorry, I, th I think with reference to Amoebics, it's like, of the, the time of Arise, we'd actually come out of Bristol um, and had this kind of like li living in there for maybe four years in the city, having moved up from from the countryside and growing up in rural Devon and Cornwall. So, the kind of attitude mm. that we had had been formed earlier on, on in life, much like yourself. It's this kind of yeah. real deep connection with the earth and with the mythological cycles and with the whole um, the whole natural world itself. So I think I think that's almost like something something I, I pulled up with myself and so did Stig up into our work in Bristol and something that continued to be the 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 main sort of working um uh access really for 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 the whole amoebics kind of thing so yeah we, the way that we were different is we were not a political entity um we were sort of trying to yeah. tell um mythological stories using um 
uh, archetypal images and stuff like that. I was trying to trying to use. I mean, I didn't have an education. I was just a, a I was a kid from a from a, um, a comprehensive school with two thousand uh, pupils in it, and everybody was anonymous as a as a as, as a um, consequence of that. You know, so you had, just had to make your own way in life after that, and it was all either going to mm. be the, the shipyards or the the RAF for me, or it would have been the the Marines or the Navy or something like that. And there, was, there weren't many other opportunities, but as I say, like yourself, it's that kind of initial response to the natural world and going, actually, all that other stuff is peripheral and this is what's real. Eh? Yeah, and a lot of the punk rock bands were like, you know, telling everyone how we're destroying the environment, you know, and, it, you know, everything we're doing is evil, but they live in filth and squalor and, you know, <laughs> the, the picture of the band is, you know, in, in some, you know, in some alleyway surrounded by garbage bins. It's like, I live out here in the country, Yeah, you know, and 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 you know and and you're telling me in the city that we're destroying the place. Look where you live, and and you know on the rare occasion that you'd go travel into the big city somewhere and go see a punk band, like I, I learned pretty on pretty early that when you'd spark up a conversation with somebody at the bar or whatever, you just couldn't mention that you lived in the country and you worked like at a sawmill or because you know I didn't always work at cattle station. I started working at a sawmill. That was the only local employer, as you're saying, you know the shipyard or the armed forces. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you couldn't, you just couldn't tell anybody because everyone would be on their, on their high horse, you know, yeah, all for a piss. And so you just would just go and talk about the band or whatever. You just wouldn't talk. And, and that became what I would talk about in the country as well. Like when I'd go out working on a cattle station or whatever, a couple of times I made the mistake of having like punk rock playing mm-hmm. like in my room or whatever, or like if we even had a room, depending on where we were working, but a lot of the time they were just big sheds and, and man, some of these bush fellas, I would just, it was like you were pouring acid down their ears. Like, <laughs> yeah. and like they were good guys. Like, I didn't want to get in a big argument, you know, with these dudes who are hard work and just simple country people. So, you know what? I'll just put my earphones in. And yeah. um, it's my little, it's my little personal thing. I'm not going to go jamming it down anyone's neck. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so Matt, um, coming on to this, an obvious period in your life when you went into the military, and how did that come about? Uh, so um, ever since I was young, uh, always read, um, always reading books, you know, Young Kid, Biggles, all that sort of stuff, the Commando comics, all that sort mm. of crap. And then as I got older, I just had a real thing for history, like whether it was natural history. And and the reason why the military was always just an option for me is because, um, you know, I left school really early, couldn't sit still, was always in trouble. Um, and back in the 90s, you didn't need a to be like a a, a, tech, a whiz tech guru like you do need to be in the army now. Um, it's very technological advanced now. You've got to be all over everything. But back then, uh, the Australian army, infantry in particular, they just went bush. You lived out of your pack and you patrolled around. Like This is a hangover from the Vietnam War where the Australian army succeeded very, were very successful in jungle warfare against, you know, the Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese. Yeah. Um, and so I just read a lot about it and, it was a way out and I know it was at odds at the music I was listening to, but the thing that really appealed to me was the challenge and sure. a way of escaping um, and a way of just getting out of my comfort zone and leaving home. Cause you know, as all your mates leave, you know what I mean? Like when you're 17, 18 year old, everyone get, you know, goes to boarding school, I go away and work in the mines or whatever. And there was mm. only sort of a few that left. And so I just had my application in to join the army. It was just something I always wanted to do. Again, I was the only one out of my group of mates that did that. Mm-hmm. Um, they were like, what are you doing that for? Get told what to do. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you know, you get slaughtered. And I'm like, yeah, but what are you doing, mate? Like you're yeah. shoveling concrete all day. You're going to shovel concrete for the next 30 years? Like, yeah. It sounds so, like so you... that was, again, Go on. You know, I kind of lost a lot of mates off. Mm-hmm. You know, they just, it was just something I did on my own. And, yeah, and yeah. It, it, it sounds like left. it sounds like you were kind of like a a, a young guy who's sort of fit and healthy, uh, motivated, uh, still kind of like well into the life experience, and really wanted to kind of like get out on that adventure a bit more. Yeah, it was just the challenge to see, because I, you know, when you're young, you don't really have that much confidence, and I just thought I'm just going to join up and just see how I go. And and so I joined the reserves first, which is like the territorials that you have in uh, in the UK. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I joined the territorials or the reserves, they call them here, when I was 17, which is just like part-time, and just to get a, a taste of it, 
Um, and the dudes I met there, they were just the best blokes. Like, yeah. and that was where true mateship came along. Like, they would they'll give you the shirt off your back, literally, you know, and you'd go through these hardships together. You'd go out on some exercise out for the jungle warfare center or something and just get absolutely flogged living in the mud. And you'd come back and you're like, man, that was intense. And then you'd go back home to all your mates and like, what have they done? What, what, what have yeah. they done in the two weeks you've been away? They were just getting drunk, riding motorbikes, smashing their motorbikes, injuring themselves. It's like, yeah. 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 They, they, they don't tend to have moved on from that kind of, uh, that, eternal childhood sort of thing but you know that's that seems to be something that surrounds us as we get older as well some people stay mm. in that pool it's almost like a kind of like security blanket sort of stuff you know and for my yeah, my yeah and then go on oh no, i was just gonna say i ended up going full-time like just to reiterate what you're saying there um i ended up going full-time and then did 20 years um wow. and then when i when i got out i went back to where I grew up and caught up with a lot of my old mates and, and they just had a, a real sense of regret that they yeah. hadn't done something challenging when they were younger. Cause now they're all like in their forties they're in some middle management position. You know, they probably mm. got a divorce under their belt. They're struggling with their weight, with their, with their health. Yeah. You know, and they're just like, man, I'd love to do something like that now, but it's just too late. I've got too much responsibility. Whereas when you're 20, you got no responsibility except yourself, you know, yeah, damn. And that made me really, yeah, and that made me really happy that I'd done that. You know, I had a lot of bad things happen and a lot of injuries and stuff, but I made it through and it ended up just being the right thing to do. Uh, that, yeah. that, that seems to be one of these um, overarching themes with when you get in a gr inside a group of people that, that require um it's not just discipline but it's kind of like they require you to uh, to make a commitment you know it's almost like um it's like biker gangs or something like that you know it's like if you if you go into um, a set of people that have discipline um such mm. as obviously in, in in the armed forces and stuff like that you tend to look after one another and you respect one another because you know that you've had to go through a certain uh, process to get where you are so wh whereas you know, anybody can spike up their hair and put a patch on their back and and there's no kind of like yeah. there's no there's no um process of refinement you know there's no rite of passage involved so so a lot of lazy people yeah. take that yeah and you know again when i'll be on leave like when i you get you get a fair bit of time off in the army you know you go see a band or whatever and again you, you just keep it to yourself you wouldn't man, dare mention because you'd have every, you'd have everybody telling you that you're just a pawn well we're all pawns to the powers you know the international powers that pull the strings on everybody you know <laughs> yeah we're all beholden to the powerful things but at least i know that and having spent 20 years there i know that in the australian army you, you're not going to be put in a position where you're going to be really committing any sort of unethical, um, you know, yeah. acts, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, pretty straightforward. And, you know, yeah, yeah, so, yeah, like we're not going to, Australia's a pretty civilised country, like, you know, but it's a big machine. So with every big machine and all big governments, think there's fuck-ups, you know. Yeah. But, but generally, I knew that there was never going to be well, I hoped, and it ended up being right, that there was never going to be any situation. I was like, okay, you know, we're going to go commit genocide over here, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Oops. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's yeah. Not, like, not like the fucking Congo, mate. Yeah. Um, nah. But, nah. Um, yeah, okay. I mean, we're... we're um, so we're at the point, really, you've done 20 years in the Army. Did you rise through the ranks? Were you an NCO? Did you get any sort of status there at all? How did you do? Uh, so, so, again, it took me a while to grow up. So once I was in a job... I moved around a fair bit. They were all combat jobs. Um, once I would start to reach a position where rank would be starting to get pushed on you, uh, I'd, I'd call transfer and go do something else. Uh, oh, so okay. that I would always be on the tools. I would always be on the tools with the with yeah. the boys. They prefer to be a grunt. of that yeah. offer. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I was, in, I was infantry and then I, um, I had a break for 18 months where I um, travelled around Australia a fair bit and did the reserve thing again. And then I, and then I joined up and... Um, then I joined up and uh, did the armored core thing with the armored vehicles for a while, and then they were like, "Hey, it's time for you to be to be promoted." And I'm like, "Ugh!" I went back to infantry, um, mm. and I did nine years there, and then I did selection to be in a special, uh, like a particular unit. Mm. Um, incredibly hard, life changing, 
life-changing process um, to even get fit enough to turn up. Okay. Um, and then from there, that was one of the greatest things I did because you're working with a different caliber of people again. Yeah. Um, and, and you're starting from the beginning. So even though you're fairly senior in your previous unit and role, you, when you go to a new unit or a new job, you basically start again because, you know, it's a different trade basically. Uh, yeah. And it was great. Pay so was it, awesome. And so is it more of a, an elite sort of um, uh, sector then was it? Yeah, yeah, it was a it was a very small unit. Australian Army is only fairly small. Um, it was, yeah. I won't, I won't get into too much. I, yeah. I don't want to turn this into like a big military podcast. Yeah, yeah. But well, let's let's but, skip past that, and let's let's say yeah. you've twenty years in the military for Matt. Um, and you did you end up just coming back home to the same place? Uh no. So I um. Yeah, no, I didn't uh, because I had children by this stage, you know, um, and I had to kind of, when I got out I ha- and then that relationship ended and I had to, when I got out, one of the reasons why I got out is because I was having trouble getting regular access to my children when I was part of a unit that would, you know, at the drop of a hat could, could go somewhere. Mm-hmm. So, um, so basically it reached, it'd been 20 years and there was a massive cultural change. Uh, it, and with cultural change, yeah, it's good sometimes, but when you're being taken away from training to to sit down in an office and be told about all these cultural changes, it's if it's making your chances of being killed on the battlefield greater because you're not out training. You know what I mean? It's like, well, I got I got two boys. I've had enough mates killed. Uh, the more of these stupid briefs we go to. Um, telling us that, you know, bashing your wife's bad. Everyone knows that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, instead of at the range training, uh, there's more chances of me being killed. Uh, and I'm not seeing my children as much. They were starting to grow up. I've got some sons and they were starting to grow up in an age where they needed their dad. Uh, combined with injuries, uh, I did several trips overseas and had some um, issues going on over there. I just had some injuries from that. So, Matt, um Let's talk about you leaving the military after 20 years of service. That's a long, long time. Um, coming back home, and um, I guess your perspective on life would have changed quite a lot. Uh, and you you moved into farming at some point. Was that straight away, or was it something you gradually gravitated toward? Um, yeah, so, yeah, leaving after 20 years, um, it was definitely time to go, but the biggest struggle to begin with was just finding that sense of purpose. Like everyone hears about it, but when you about how, when you leave the military, everyone struggles with a sense of purpose and you think, Oh, I'll be right. You know, I can't wait to leave, but it really hits you hard. Um, mm-hmm. you know, you're not surrounded by, you know, for the last 20 years, you've been hanging out with all your mates, training hard together, you know, going for coffees, going for beers, you know? Yeah. Is there like a lack of, of connection? Is there like a lack of yeah. like a good connection with, with the guys? Yeah. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, like, you're on your own and you keep contact with your mates, you know, but they're working, you know, and you've got other guys that get out and they disappear off wherever they end up going. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was a bit of travelling around, a bit of unsettlement um, to begin with, but that was just mainly to get... I had to sort out uh, access to my children and um, had to get that, like, a routine going there. And my, it was a lot of it was also to get my wife's career on track as well. Um mm-hmm. And then farming kind of just came like, I did a few little odd jobs, some some um, unusual forms of security work, let's just <laughs> call it that. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and it was like, you know, well, this is kind of like, you know, one of the reasons why I left the military is spend more time with my children and now I'm away, you know, yeah. again. So that, that got cut pretty quick. Um, and then the farming kind of just came naturally because I had to have land after, you know, when you're in the army, you don't have a choice where you live. You kind of got to live where you're needed. And that was Mm. in the big cities and it killed me. Um, So I found a place in the bush after growing up where I grew up, it was extremely hot and dry where I grew up uh, and where I settled uh, was green mountains, you know, water creeks that don't dry up completely Mm. different. And all and I loved it. And the farming kind of, I, I was trying to relearn all those things that I should have paid more attention to when I was a teenager living, mm. you know, 
you know, you're trying to think, oh, what do I do with this sort of cattle? How do I do this again? And then you just realize how much when you're a teenager, your mind's just somewhere else. You're not paying yeah. attention. You know, you're thinking about girls, you're thinking about bikes, you're thinking <laughs> about, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah, but you must have picked up a whole load of stuff. You must have picked up a whole load of stuff along the way working with these kind of like uh, roughneck fellas growing up. Yeah, yeah, and it's there in the background. You just have to remember it. You know what mm. I mean? And why you did it. You know why yeah. did we move the cattle around this way, or why did we put the fence this way? And you think, well, I just did it that way because I was told to do it because you know I was a young bloke. Yeah. Um, now you're trying to figure out the reasons behind it all. You know. Yeah, and you, you often find that it does make there's a, there's a reason for everything. That's why it makes sense, and that it all, all comes together in a whole. I guess, yeah. Well, yeah, I was going back and helping on the family farm uh, mm. way up north, and the old man had that set up in a way. Um, everything had a reason, everything had a purpose, and you know, mm. it's just, yeah. So talk us through so, like yeah. a well, talk talk us through a typical day on a farm in Australia. I mean, when when are you up? What do you, what do you, how does the day go? Ah, uh, well, it, every farm's kind of different. Like um, this one here, I'm pretty good. I'm set up fairly well financially. Um, so this one is more just extra money and something to keep me busy. You know what I mean? So yeah. if I've got a day where um, fairly intensive labour, one day I, I can structure my week so that I have a few rest days, you know, because we're all getting on a bit. Mm. Um, and one of the big things about forced me into farming, sorry, was just, after being in the military and having about 400, you know, levels of governance above you, uh, I, I kind of came to the conclusion, oh, I'm never having a boss again, like never. <laughs> yeah. Um, never again. I'll do no matter what i got to do. I'm just going to keep working for myself. I've mm. just had an absolute gut full of being beholden to others and having to explain shit to everybody i just do my own thing now um yeah. so for me here it's kind of it all depends whether i've got my my boys or not um but generally get i get up pretty early because i've got a bit of a light sleeper anyway it's normally you know just a bit before sort of sunlight or whatever hmm. um once the sun's up i'll go down the creek and have a swim every morning um, nice even in even in winter uh like we get some pretty wild frosts um yeah. And that kind, I kind of got onto that from that Wim Hof, the Ice Man. I don't know if you've heard of yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, I have. He's world, yeah, he's broken a heap of world records, and he, and he's big on the health aspects. So I've got a lot of injuries, and I just find that, you know, some mornings I wake up, I feel like I've been run over by a truck. Sure. You know, you haven't slept very well. You're worrying about something or whatever, and your head's just like full of static. I just throw me swimmers on and just run down to the creek with a frost everywhere. The dogs all come with me. And he just jump in that freezing water, mm -hmm. stick, you know, stick your fingers in your ears, keep your head under the water for 10 seconds, count to 10, and then swim across the creek, come back and go up the house and have breakfast. And that, it, it just, yeah. it, it's surreal. It's like you're on another, when you're in that, it's crystal clear water. Like this isn't some muddy old, dirty old, you know, this is mm. coming straight down out of the mountains. Um, oh, you know, it might be four to five degrees or whatever in winter and, um, it's absolutely life changing. Um, yeah, that's something, mate. I mean, I I think it's like the whole Wim Wim Hof thing is like this. Uh, yeah, like super endorphins and um, clearing out the, oh, yeah. the the mind. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, yeah. So you it come back completely and, wipe the mind. Yeah, mm. and you come back. You have you have a spot of breakfast after this freezing cold uh, genital shrinking swim. Oh and, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like where did that thing go again? What is that? <laughs> oh yeah, he's gone, mate. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, little 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 pistachio <laughs> <laughs> exactly it's like that used to be my proud and joy look at him now but, yeah. uh, pride and joy really. so yeah so yeah you get your breakfast in and then you head out for the day yeah so the um the cold swim as a second thing it's it's my reward so like my breakfast then is my reward for the hard thing i did like if you reward yourself constantly the, the rewards have no meaning after a while you know what i mean so if i just get up and have a leisurely breakfast with a nice hot coffee every morning, it's no longer a special event, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So the way I earn that is to, you know, I don't want to go down there half the time, but, you know, I do. And then afterwards, it's just like, yep, I fucking did it. You know, yeah. it's my little challenge for the morning. Go up, have breakfast. And then it's either moving cattle around because, you know, you've got to rotate paddocks to keep the worms down, you know. Here, our cattle are almost like our pets. Um, yeah. The wife's given them all names, which you should never do, but she's given them all names. Um, <laughs> do you have to say goodbye to them? Oh, 
Do yeah. you have to say goodbye We're, to them? Yeah. When they go to the when they go off to the ads, yeah, yeah, you know, you put them on the truck and it's like, see you fellas. The wife um, inside, she can't handle yeah. it, seeing them go. But yeah. All you can do is make their lives as good and stress free as they are, you know what I mean? Because everything in life on the planet is here for something else. You know, you can't exist without something else being consumed or yeah. pushed out of the way. You know yeah, I mean? I'm, so. I'm not, I'm not overly sentimental with with that kind of thing at all. You know, I'm not a vegetarian, but not, mm. I'm not belligerently like, you know, I hate fucking vegans, man. It's like n- none of that sort yeah. of stuff. It's like you do what you do. Um, yeah, and uh, you know, uh, and, and we all we all have a different um, approach to life depending on you know what 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 experiences we've had as well. And you know, I respect people that that can try and give an animal a good life and also you yeah. got kind of fatalism as well about like well this is what's going to happen at the end of the day and you know it's got to be difficult i mean even on on my scale all i had was some chickens and no i don't even like chickens but you know you go hmm well <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's like these horrible yeah. little, uh, uh, little sort of dinosaur reptile things but um oh they're, yeah. they're evil little fuckers don't worry about aren't them. they <laughs> aren't they just, yeah. yeah so yeah, yeah we've still got eggs and all that um, so is it a hard day? Uh, it depends. So if I'm doing cattle stuff, d- generally not. And it depends whether it's summer or not. Um, I love working in winter mm. uh, just because, you know, when I was in the army, went to Afghanistan, Iraq, you know, it gets up to 50 degrees over there. I've just had an absolute gutful mm. of hot weather. So I'll try to do most of my laborious sort of work through winter. And summer, I tend to just take it easy and do, you know, fiddly sort of things. But so if I'm doing cattle, it's generally not that hard. Mm. Um but, you know, I also do a lot of stuff with timber. So on my property here, they had a pretty severe bushfire go through a few years ago, and there's a lot of standing dead timber. Yeah. Um, so this stuff dead. So I, I cut that down and turn it into firewood, or I might have to, um, and that's hard work. Um, yeah. Also a lot of um, weed control. So because the fertile is so good, because uh, sorry, because the soil is so fertile here, we get a lot of weed issues and, you know, the whole hippie mentality of oh we just leave it the way it is i'm, I'm sorry but you know europeans yeah. came here 200 years ago and brought all these mongrel seeds with them uh that aren't meant to live here and if we just leave it the place it you know we can't there's certain areas of australia that you just can't leave and let nature take over unless you're going to leave it for 200 years and you know yeah. that doesn't really help anymore but to, to sidetrack so you uh, let me sidetrack you just a second from that kind of uh, about the land and things like that how do you feel about these new kind of um, restrictions coming in around the Aboriginal land laws? And, you know, it's from, from what I can see from over here, it's like you, some farmers can only scrape like 50 mil into the soil with it before they have to get permission from your local Aboriginal council or something. Yeah, it's just another form of governance, control, and yeah. and somebody trying to make it's a scam. Yeah, know? it's a rev- revenue raising raising issue. You can see that from a mile off, and it's kind of like similar yeah. to this whole thing, the phenomena that the Dutch farmers are going through at the moment, where they're trying to strip them of their land and their income, their livelihood, and yeah. almost like forcing forcing us into this pseudo kind of like famine situation so again they can get control and eventually be able to say well you know we can we can start to dictate who gets what food where and when um and yeah. you, know, you you eat the bugs as the uh, as the meme goes you know crazy stuff yeah and that that i know what you're talking about there that's over in western australia they're on another planet that like australia is so big you know western australia is like comparing you know spain to norway you know what i mean like mm. <laughs> um it's really odd and it's just their labor left government seems to be hell bent on bringing on all these schemes but it's just a scam it it starts off as a good idea people have a good idea you know what about the original indigenous owners yep okay yeah yep fair enough however you know that was 200 years ago none of you guys actually physically got kicked off your land none of the farmers that are there now physically kicked you off the farmers that are there now are busting their asses to pay the mortgage um, yeah. you know, and and it's just these inner city groups that happen to have a certain lineage go here's mm. a way that we can just scam people and it's what they yeah. don't realize it, it's just another level of governance that makes farming harder like, it's just, it's the same thing I, yeah go on 
no, no, you're um, right. And it just... I mean, it's the same thing all over. It's like this whole this whole thing about um, creating an environment about you know guilt for who you are and who your who your people have been, all the rest of that, and this idea about separating you from your cultural heritage and all the rest because of the bad things yeah. that somebody somebody did back when or whatever. But the I think the, the problem that we have as as Europeans, you know, through through lineage and stuff like that, is this kind of propensity to try and do the right thing, and that's almost like our our great Achilles heel. And it's like the way that we're always attacked is through the fact that mm. we want to be we want to be good, we want to do the right thing, yeah. we want to take care of things. You're so just get taken advantage of. Yeah. Well, absolutely, because that's that's it. That's where people can dig in and they can say, "Oh, we can do this time and time and time again. We can get them through the." Oh, somebody was a slave once or a slave owner and all the rest of it. And like you quite rightly say, there is no there's no actual physical connection to anything whatsoever in the present no. day. Plus the fact that um, at the end of the day, it's us or our people or our lineage that actually put an end to all of this kind of stuff in the first place. So, you know, it, without without yeah. that, this would still be a, a worldwide phenomenon, which, of course, it is in many sectors of the world. It's it's slavery is going on very well. And 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 and. Um, oh and creating great revenues for, for people. But, to, you know, you talk about that and, and you're going to be an R-ist word, you know what I mean? So same bullshit yeah, yeah. all over. So let's yeah. have a look at... at um... they, they pick and choose. They pick and choose. Like, like, where do you draw the line? So, you know, what about... Okay, so my I have to hand this property over here to, say, some Indigenous people that come out here, have no idea how to manage it, have no idea where the sacred sites are. They grew up 200 kilometres away. You know what I mean? They've got no idea. Sure. I've got to hand that over to them. Where do we go? Like I was born here. My parents yeah. were born here, or yeah. one of my parents was born here. But the other ones, my mum's side went all the way back to convict time. So th they came over here on a convict ship yeah. in 1852 uh, or something for manslaughter. Like where's their reparations? So do they then <laughs> get their reparations off the crown because they had those ridiculous, you know, let's say everyone of the colonies laws back then. Yeah. Like, where does it stop? Well, the Normans, you know, the Normans going to have to, you know, pay reparations to the Saxons. You know, how yeah. far are we going to go back? They yeah, just pick yeah. and choose. All this, all this kind of like this py pyramid of, of, of victim culture as well. I mean, it just, it serves to humiliate the individual and to keep them within a, within a very um, restricted circle as well. So, you know, the, the, the atomization and the, and the breaking up of culture into these tiny little groups that find no way to be able to communicate with one another. I mean, it's the, the end goal is the old divide and conquer, because we do find that basically speaking, most of us just want to get on. We want to live our lives. We want to look after our families. Yeah. We, want to, we want to do the best that we can for the people around us. You know, this is a phenomenon that, that, yeah. that, um, that, uh, that goes past sort of race or cultural background and stuff like that. People are generally speaking pretty good. Um, yeah. But I think there's, as I say, there's, there's speculative interests that know that that's an issue because there's so few of these sociopathic types in the world that they know damn well they're so, so far outnumbered by the rest of the decent, normal people that once the, the only way they can do to control is by breaking it up. Um, so we can yeah. no longer hear. And that, that. They know to do that. They know to do that by by penetrating the bureaucracy. Once the bureaucracy gets rolling, all the bureaucrats and the civil servants and the people, they all know it's all stupid law, but they, yeah. everyone's got to go along with it. Once it gets rolling, you can't stop it. And it just takes these people to get it started. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And there are, it's, all, it's, all, it's all just about money. And it's, like, it's such a shame because people that are... Uh, they, they seek their kind of security and meaning through money and possessions and stuff. And whilst, you know, you and I have probably done pretty well for ourselves in this life and, you know, we've got all the little trinkets and stuff that we need. We've had times without. Um, and oh, you yeah. Know, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that you, you know, you can do that. And that's just fine, too. And that, that that's not the be all and end all. It's, it, but it's more about the, you know, the reality of life and what you're going to do with this, because it's, it's a unique um it's a unique experience in the in the universe it's something that you know you you kind of need to try and make an effort to figure it out it's like you can sit around sniffing glue and 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 drinking yourself senseless and uh, okay it's like well wasted opportunity mate you know there's, there's things mm. things we need to understand so i'm going to try and go on a little bit more into um the jibby jabby experience in australia because you know the the rest of us in Europe and probably in North America as well, have been looking on in absolute horror, but besides like Canada, 
um, at Australia and this kind of like people like your Dan Andrews down there and all the rest of it. It, it, it oh, looked yeah, like yeah. it looked like an extended prison camp. So what what was the experience like of the last three years or so down there? Um, it really depended on what state you lived in. The states were so um, different. Um, and but generally it boiled down to the states that had a Labour government with a strong green backing. They're the ones that just ruled with an iron fist. So, you know, Melbourne had the was the most locked down city in the entire world, although I think that may have been beaten by um, China uh, in recent times with their yeah. zero COVID policy. Um, but it was absolutely and it seemed to just happen overnight. Like I remember it was around March or something. There was mumblings of it and everyone was just like, I don't know we weren't paying much attention and then on on Sunday night the Queensland Premier which is Queensland's a fairly large state in Australia with a Labor government um basically just said it was Sunday night Monday night we're closing the border everyone was just like what the hell and there was just a mad scramble like I had stuff going on on either side of the border hmm. and it was just heaps it was just absolute mental because we didn't know what it meant um so, you know, had to sort of prioritise everything to where family was and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And then we just went into this period of lockdown and it was it was just so sudden um, and was just so all-consuming. Like there were daily briefs. Like it was the same as over there. But yeah, Victoria, the state of Victoria, Queensland and Western Australia, the three Labor ones. I think Tasmania's a Labor government as well, but no one really goes there anyway because it's kind of like an island. So they are pretty quiet, you know. But mm. it was brutal. Like that, where, Victoria just wanted to abs had the curfews. Like you weren't even allowed outside your house. Like it was absolute destruction of small business and the middle yeah. class. Yeah. Western Australia, because they're way over the other side, there's a desert between them. They just were hell bent on not letting anyone into their state. It was a, an iron border. Yeah. Um, whereas they had relative freedom within Western Australia from what I can remember. Queensland, because it's population, the border's quite populated with Northern New South Wales. It had an iron border as well, like organized crime and all that sort of stuff must've just been having a great you know, field day <laughs> because every police officer was trying to man a border like the size of England, sure, yeah. <laughs> you know, the length of England. Um, and it was just absolute chaos and people reacted fairly different. Some people were just absolutely horrified and up in arms. Mm. Other people just went along with it. Some people, it was the excuse they needed to stop working because the government just, you know, bread and circuses threw the bit of gold around and they yeah. came up with the COVID payments. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people that had small businesses and were kind of like had a bit of a lazy sort of, you know, attitude to them anyways like well why would i go to work why would i try and juggle you know meeting these crazy guidelines they keep putting down if you want to trade i could just mm. shut down my business sit at home and accept covid payments and lots of people did that yeah you um, can see this great social experiment that, that the it's exactly the same method and the, exactly the same outcome in any in any country that you choose there's this kind of the, mm. the, the thing that goes and it's almost you know it's a self-selective process as well it really it separates the wheat from the chaff and you can you can really notice the people that Im immediately sort of like bend over and go yeah okay that's fine i'll take all that kind of stuff mm. but i think that probably the same that you got there there's this sort of like a hangover that's left there's a kind of pavlovian response which is lurking in the background now and it's ready to be um triggered again so you know we, we just need the 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 who or whichever governing body to to be able to to push that button uh, and people will, will mm. go back into type and they i don't think they can they can they can remember a time before that because you know it's yeah. it's it's so different now um mm. but it's gone in these small increments it's like the tiny little footsteps one at a time that have accumulated into such a vast difference between a person back in 2019 and a person in 2023 there's an extraordinary mm. Um, social, uh, as I say, uh, kind of like psychological uh, difference in our in our um, intrinsic social patterning now, and that we're we're ready mm. to be told when we do this and when we do that, and the tr the traditional two fingers up response is almost completely gone. You know, I think it's there's something like um, this uh, this idea about there's usually between seven and ten percent of people that say no to these authoritarian ideas, and I think that probably rings true over here. Although probably like Australia, most most people that are against it 
kept their mouth shut and they kind of like just kept getting on and, and keeping under the radar and doing their thing. Would do you say that's true for your experience? Uh, yes, but there was also um, a, a lot of people like don't think that there wasn't resistance here, but the way it was reported and crushed and people made examples of uh, was really mm. disgusting, really. Yeah. And, um, you know, so I've got a mate, really level-headed fella, you know, started his own business, shoveled all of his life savings into this business. And when the lockdowns happened and only essential businesses could trade and some, you know, class of, you know, with strict guidelines, they fought really hard to stay open. And so that kind of annoyed him and he went to the protests. Hmm. And this guy is not a fool. Um, and he was he was there and he was saying there were at least 100,000 people at this protest in Sydney, like the hmm. biggest ever gathering of people yeah. in Sydney. And he and when everyone was there, it was very um, everyone was there for the same reason. Like there were groups in Australia that don't get along. You know, hmm. there were Muslims there. There were Jewish people there. There were Aboriginal people there doing the smoking ceremony, you know, in all their garb, you know. Yeah. You know, everyone was there to protest. You know, you're destroying our livelihoods. You're only locking down certain neighbourhoods in Sydney, not mm -hmm. all of them. Um, and, you know, and he was like, that was a pretty positive experience. You know, a few little scuffles here and there. And he goes, I I'm looking forward to see how this gets reported on news that night. He went home and then on the news, they reported it as about three to 5,000 Nazis. <laughs> yeah. Extreme right wing <laughs> and they originals. Some, yeah, but they just show some stock footage. There was like one drunk guy who like punched a police horse like in the face. Like what what yeah. worse thing can you do than punch your horse? Yeah. Like, and they just kept showing that stock footage over and over again. And it was just like, man, so they, they, they were completely underreported. So anyone that was kind of like, you know, that might be in, inspired by, hey, you know, it, there's lots of people that feel the way I do, hmm. but were locked in their home, turn on the TV, no reporting. If you go outside, you're a Nazi, you're a conspiracy theorist. And then, you know, there was the cases of widely publicised cases of, you know, six police people barging into a pregnant woman's house because she tried to organise a, a socially distant yeah. freedom rally in her hometown and six policemen, you know, our police are stretched yeah. here, you know. At the yeah, they dragged her off when she was, she was waiting for an appointment, wasn't she, so Yeah, she was going to get an ultrasound and they carted her off in her pyjamas with another screaming kid, like, yeah, you know. And, you know, and then, you know, people sitting on a beat bench by himself, you know, and two cops are coming up, not socially distancing, and they're just, like, dragging them off. And, and my mate who had this business, um, he's married to a girl that um, is from a very small but incredibly um, oh, family-orientated ethnic community. Mm -hmm. And all these – the cops were just parking out the front of his business, and just waiting for them to walk past without a mask on and just coming in and finding and finding him again and again and again. And his wife refused to wear one, yeah. but he was wearing one. And she's like, why aren't you wearing one? And he's like, you don't understand. Like, they will just smash me. Yeah, <laughs> They will drag me. If I say a single word, they'll just drag me across the ground. You know, there's drug deals happening in the car park and he's going to the cops. Like, you know, there's drug deal happening just over there. It happens here nearly every day. And the cops are like, we don't care about it. Like, yeah, isn't it extraordinary? How, yeah, yeah how, how how these uh, how these these guys managed to turn on this kind of like real, real nasty authoritarian stuff in the, in in themselves, and and they've all forgiven themselves now. It's like ah, well, you know that we had to do that sort of stuff back then, and all this. It's like you didn't have to do any of that, mate. You didn't have to do any of that at all. It's just yeah, you turned you turned into the into everything you you you're accusing everybody else of being. It's like you turned into thugs, yeah, brown shirts, and you and you try and disguise that as being the good guys and you're not none of you are the good guys and all these people that turned around and vilified us you know yeah and it's that label giving you know so anyone that dared say anything you're a conspiracy theorist nut job you know yeah. what i mean like just that yeah. label oh well that you deserve to be you know have your face dragged across the gutter by the yeah. you know Disgusting. but but saying that you know on a positive note heaps of cops refused to get the jab yeah. and refused to, um and all got sacked um, which is a big deal because in New South Wales, they adopted a pol uh, business model for their police force where um, they don't just do recruiting. They don't just recruit someone off the street. You have to pay for your 
training in the police force like and then you get like a hex mm. debt you know like a university debt yeah like a student loan yeah yeah to become a police officer so they're only attracting people so people go to police academy and got to pay for their own um you know training <laughs> I didn't know that. so why, why would you ever risk being sacked um if you're then going to get sacked from a job that you spent six months training for and you've now got a fifteen thousand dollar debt for or whatever you know what i mean like they've got you that's that's yeah. how they buy them that's how they get them i didn't know that at all i mean we have something over here now where the the initiative is to um they stop recruiting the police from the from the forces the services and all that because these are yeah mm. these are tough, tough guys or at least they used to be until recent times of course and you've mm. got this dei inclusion nonsense going on throughout everything mm. but the um one one of the um, requirements now for the, for the police over here is that you have a um uh, that you've studied and that you have a degree you know so you've got all these guys yeah. been through that um the, the the education mill which of course itself is heavily loaded with this whole bias um so they oh, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so they come and, and they can't do anything about anything at all because they're so bloody sensitive to everybody's feelings mm. that it's it's pretty much useless few pretty quick questions for you are you pretty self-sufficient there um yes are you ready for uh, the zom zombie apocalypse kind of thing or are you have you got most of your stuff in in place uh, we, you know, being self-sufficient is kind of one of my little hobby things and we've kind of done the best we can. You know, we've got the, the, um, the Tesla power wall, you know, the solar power oh, going to the batteries. Right. So is that the, good? You know, the, well, yeah, because of the bushfires a few years ago, where I make a lot of my money from cutting down the dead trees and turning into the firewood, they fall down all the time and knock the power lines around. Mm. So we get a lot of power blackouts. So we crack shits with it. Um, a few right. years. Or a, year, a year ago and got the um the battery powered solar so we're still on mains but if it cuts out the batteries just kick in. yeah yeah okay um, so so and yeah i mean i suppose what, that's what we've been trying to do here as well on my little place i mean we've 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 got maybe like about a third of an acre or something so it's nothing at all you know it's a little poly tunnel we grow some food we look after mm. things over the years I'll be just adding bits and pieces you know you get a chainsaw or you get something that you can do mm. this and do that and all the rest so there's no way we're self-sufficient, but we're we're kind of you know there's a there's a few weeks of the year where we can feed ourselves off what we have. Oh yeah, yeah, and that yeah, makes yeah, you really proud yeah. of. I mean, it makes you feel good, doesn't it? That kind of thing. It's like I can look after yeah. my family, um, and uh, my my aspirations are increasingly is like get away from that stuff because yeah, but all, with all the power the power play that's going on at the moment, the the overall the overarching ability for people to just simply shut people down um online and mm. just turn turn all of their resources off um Matt. Oh, yeah the um the, the logistic chain failure across COVID in australia was massive um empty supermarkets all the time just because oh. you know borders were shut you know and so that was a big wake-up call i was kind of ready for that stuff it didn't really affect us that much at all out here in the, in the bush um mm -hmm. we, we got sort of fruit trees and you know veggies and that going and meat yeah. and eggs and all that sort of stuff but, yeah so some mean, people really suck yeah yeah i'm guessing that yeah you know i've been to australia and i i, I had six weeks there i ended up in tasmania you know, you know I'd, I'd look around back in the 90s where um where you were a rich man if you had a tenner in your pocket over there now of course it's, it seems like uh, yeah australians you all discovered the opal mines and all the rest of it you all became rich overnight and had <laughs> big boats in their backyards and now we can't afford a bloody bag of chips when we get down there so uh but yeah mm. I, I i enjoyed australia um what are you reading at the moment matt um oh what am i reading i'm What's actually on? i had a bit of a break from the uh john lamb lash and the um and i'm actually attempting to read a book about the battle of Towton. okay um know where the lancasterians and the yorkists finally oh well, okay so like, like, is it wars of the roses kind of thing then yeah yeah it's where it all came to an end it was the biggest single slaughter on british soil in history oh, okay so do you, do you read a lot of sort of um historical military based stuff and things as well yeah so yeah. when i was younger military books loved them now i'm kind of over them um mm -hmm. now i'm reading a lot more I love British history, um, you know, and and I'm reading a lot more um, just sort of older history books. Uh, there's a, you know, I, I, I struggle. I fought through the um, um, not in his image, 
you know, yeah. some really good, really good periods there. But there were sometimes there it was above my um, brain capacity. But um, yeah, yeah, the things that really appealed to me there was all the way through Christian school, just going, none of this makes sense. You know, there's this, there's this God that can read my thoughts. And if I even think something bad, I'm going to burn for eternity. And yeah. then when, you know, John Lamb Lash explained, just put a completely different view. And it was just like, man, this makes so much sense. Like, why are we looking away from the earth? Why are mm. we, you know, why are we ashamed that we're from earth and we need to look for some alien to, you know, live this horrid life down here and you get rewarded. You yeah. Know, we are yeah. of the earth. We can make this place, you know, our, our mother's given us everything we need here. Yeah. This, is, this, 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 this is it. This is the destination, yeah. isn't it? It's like, what a, what a wonderful yeah. place in, in, in potential, you know, we, you know, going back to that, we, you know, we've all had hard times in our lives and all that kind of stuff, but it's like, there's this, the revelation of, of, of nature and our, our our natural place within this world is is fantastic rather than this again you know the whole music scene thing it's about the turning away from stuff and negation and this whole sort of like the, the all the imagery and stuff like that i even find it difficult these days to to get into that you know um mm. so you you would you describe yourself as kind of like broadly speaking a sort of a, a gnostic kind of guy just now at this period in your life um I'm still fairly open-minded with everything because one thing I did discover going through Christian school is that everything is corrupted by people, basically. People ruin everything. Mm. You know, there's a good idea. It gets ruined by people. Like, yep. even when I was a young kid going to church, like, I can see the message of love, and but it's just been ruined by the guy that's talking to me because I know that he's a jerk. Or I know that the person that wrote the Bible was probably... A lunatic who plagiarized it from some other old story you know what i mean yeah so i fully i fully can see or believe now in it's the great deception you know like the thousands of years of slaughter through the three abrahamic religions like yeah. slaughter and just absolute decimation of anything that was earth orientated yeah so and it's like it's in those worldly yeah otherworldly you know idea um mm -hmm. what whether that's the way john L lamb lash is saying whether it's like a sophianic the, the sophianic myth or it's like i've been listening to a lot of that billy carson lately about how we just we've come from aliens or, or I, I don't know um you know yeah. when he talks about the anakim and the nephilim and all that sort of stuff like all that stuff's documented in the bible it's documented all around the world in these ancient cultures like what the right so, Matt, i don't Matt. know i Matt, I'm going to yeah. pull you in toward the end of this now because we've got two minutes left. So I'm going to try and make yeah. these concise. You've got a couple of couple of questions to get through here. Um, yep. Sorry. And right, brief as you can. Name name one important lesson that life has taught you through your journey. Oh, um, think for yourself. Um, mm -hmm. I've always found myself um, thinking differently to others and. Yes, you can go along with a group, you know, who are a bunch of good people, but you're still, at the end of the day, think for yourself and you can keep that to yourself, you know, and just shape your life accordingly. You don't, you know, or you can say it out loud. It's up to you, but just stay true to yourself and think for yourself. Use your head. Yeah. 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 Chain reaction. Best song ever. There we go. Well, listen, I was going to say to you, do you have, by any chance, a favourite Amoebix or Tailcross track you'd like us to play out with? Oh, it used to be chain reaction, but I think burn with me has taken over and it's got more, it's got more relevance in my life now that I've got the time and the resources to do some research, more research in my own time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the things that we've seen in the world about what happens if you speak out lately, I think burn with me is the song. Brilliant. Well, Matt Bush Ranger, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Um, and to really get a, a, a point of view on life where you are, um, fabulous. I mean, you, you and I are going to keep in touch. And I hope there's other listeners out there which are going to um, make a few comments here. Uh, you know, negative, positive, whatever. We don't care. Or we do if it's positive. But, um, yeah, let's, um, <laughs> let's, let's keep in touch, mate. And have a, have a yeah. great evening over there. And I'm just starting my day here. So, yeah, good, uh, good on you, mate. Thanks. Right on. Thanks, Rob. Cheers, bud. <laughs>